Good afternoon. My name is Paul Bennyworth from the Centre for Higher Education Policy Studies at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. My paper today is entitled High Level Arguments from a Low Country, Debating the Value of Arts and Humanities Research in the Netherlands. And I'm going to try and shed light today on what I think is one of the most pressing issues for research funding. That is to say, what is the public value of arts and humanities research? I'm going to argue that political debate around this topic has reached an impasse. But if you reflect upon why that has happened and why participants have polarized positions, it is, better, it is possible to better understand the value of arts and humanities research and hence devise better measures of that value. And a case study taken from one country, the Netherlands, demonstrates that that is in, in fact true. It is possible to use consensus as a way of analysing the debate. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to be present at Celtic Manor today be because of health problems. But I'm delighted that this session is taking place, and I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of everyone that's made this possible. Of course, not least, session organiser Elaine, and of course to all of you who are participating in this magnificent venue. In my presentation, I want to shed some light on a key challenge for arts and humanities research. Coming at a time when all research is under a great deal of pressure to justify itself for the funding it's received. My argument is that public debate has been conducted in terms of two seemingly incompatible arguments. By exploring those arguments more closely, it's possible to get beyond that disagreement and to gain an insight, an insight into what it is about arts and humanities research that really creates wider public value. And then studying these positions and the way they are resolved in the terms of a case study, it becomes possible to get a sense of how this consensus might exist in a wider abstract sense. My argument is premised on the idea that arts and humanities research finds itself trapped, trapped between a rock and a hard place. In public policy terms, all science and the funding it receives is justified in terms of the wider social benefits that it brings. But in recent years, what we've seen is an almost exclusive focus on economic benefits to the exclusion of other kinds of social and cultural value that that research brings. This leads, on the one hand, to a disagreement about what matters, but on the other hand, also disadvantages those subjects that create other kinds of value, the social and cultural. And so in here a value, we're looking at three cases where the debate has got beyond this simple contradiction. Today I'll present one of those, the, ne the case of the Netherlands. Now this is a UK-based conference, uh, but the context in all three of our case study countries is the same as the UK, insofar as all are greatly influenced by European research policy. And science and innovation policy within Europe are now one of the most important and best funded tasks of the European Commission. The European Commission has been at the forefront of encouraging or in enforcing universities and academics to justify themselves in terms of the admittedly generous funding that they receive for their research. And this pressure to justify themselves has been extended through the European research area not just in the 27 member countries, but also into associate participants, including Norway, Iceland, Turkey, and Israel. And what is notable is that we have seen here, as well as in the abstract, a rise in justifying that, terms, that, that value in societal terms, but principally in economic terms. And this is where the, the nub of the problem lies. When one considers how arts and humanities research creates public value, the pathways within which that knowledge flows from academic to society are much more diffuse. So in biotechnology, the standard industry drug approval process sets out quite clearly how a bi biotech patent will take knowledge from the university into the market. There'll be proof of principle, toxicity tests, in vitro and in vivo trials, then three phases of much wider clinical trials, at which point you have a product, an active ingredient, incorporated into a pill 
that still represents the knowledge in the patent. Now, by contrast, arts and humanities knowledge potentially influences many people, but in a very small way, in many almost invisible transactions. So a history book might sell 60,000 copies, but it's much harder to tell who of those buyers actually reads the book and how, of those who do read the book, how it materially influences their actions and achieves impact. So what we do know is that there are many connections from arts and humanities researchers into the public realm. But counting them and measuring their impact is in practical terms impossible. And at the same time, these researchers are feeling a pressure to be able to justify themselves and so feel the pressure of that impossibility. Humanities scholars do see themselves facing a mighty problem. They acknowledge that they need to justify themselves but are profoundly uncomfortable in using approaches which seem not really to capture what matters or the value of their research, the economic value. And that the humanities scholar's sense of crisis is compound compounded by a sense that no one on the other side of the table is listening to their arguments. They can provide evidence on an individual or project-wise basis, but that seems never to quite justify the case that humanities research is useful. Or at least the evidence isn't as compelling as the hard sciences have in the way in which all kinds of medical research on mice is seen as contributing to a solution to cancer. And it's that sense, that, that pressure, that's cast a pall on humanity's engagement with the, enga with the impact agenda. So taking a step back, we can see that there's three areas where it's relatively uncontroversial to say there is agreement about the value of arts and humanities research. So there's the macro argument that that research provides a society with an interpretive capacity to understand other cultures, both now and in the past, and to engage more fruitfully with them in terms of social and economic exchange. There's then a meso argument that education in universities in arts in humanities creates a labor force who are equipped with useful skills and then the role of the research is maintaining the vitality and contemporaneousness of that education. And there's a micro argument that for a single piece of research, there are users of that knowledge outside academia who can be found, for whom it can be shown they behave materially differently because of that research. And all of these three levels are forms of impact. But we can also see a conflict between a sense that the research can have those benefits and it always has those benefits. So public officials or the public discourse accepts the research can have those benefits, but demands proof of the veracity of the claim that they always do. Academics, on the other hand, accept that they have a public duty in their research, but resist the notion that they should aim to produce that public impact when planning and executing their research. And so what we see is that the public debate has ground to a halt. Each side are accusing the other of disingenuously misinterpreting reality and ultimately to for there to be a kind of selfishness lying behind those positions. Because we see when you really boil the arguments down to their core, the each is accusing the other of being disingenuous and selfish. Public officials argue, as we see in the quotation at the start of the presentation, they argue that academics resist accountability because of the inconvenience that it poses on them as they carry out their hobbies with taxpayers' cash. Academics argue that teaching and the research that supports it are so clearly a public benefit that a grad-grind system of measuring impact would dispirit the vitality, the very vitality on which their research depends. And both of these arguments have achieved a persistence and a persistency in public discourse. My argument is not that either party is wrong-headed, but the, what has happened is that the way these arguments are framed has created a contradiction, a contradiction that prevents progression in the debate. And so rather than looking at the arguments themselves, if we think about what the purpose of the arguments is, that helps to reframe the debate in a more constructive manner. So, in our project, the Hero Value Project, 
what we're doing is we're with European Science F Foundation money looking at how debates about the value of research take place within society in the public realm between politicians, university and societal actors as well as exploring how academics frame societal impact as part of the, the business of the research they do. And we're currently in the empirical phase doing three national case studies which will then be turned into three national reports that will be uh, three thematic reports that will be published in 2012. In this paper I want to present a brief report from the Dutch case study which is currently underway about two-thirds completed. Really to try and understand the arguments, the disagreements, the agreements and tensions and to understand the question about the contradiction of arts and humanities research, why that contradiction persists. So in practical terms, what we did was we explored debates in what the Dutch call Geesteswetenschap, or Alpha Wetenschap, translates roughly as humanities or letters. We looked in, evident, we looked in three places for our evidence. So we followed the documentary record, firstly through a series of public inquiries and commissions, but also through the, the, the highbrow Dutch press. Secondly, we're interviewing around 35 uh, elite actors and humanities scholars in a semi-structured way. And then thirdly, we were present at a consultative meeting about one of the reports in the wider debate, the Quality Indicators for Research in the Humanities report. The long-term context for the Netherlands is that since the 1980s, the place of humanities in the Dutch Academy has been contentious. The Netherlands has, or at least had, many professors in very small, specialised areas of the humanities, particularly around Asian languages, partly because of the colonial inheritance, and typified by almost no students taking those courses. And so from the late 1980s, there was a debate about how to bring those, those subjects onto a sustainable footing. And in 1991, the uh, evocatively titled Baby Krishna Report made the case for special funding to these areas and subjects to protect them. But at the same time, the Dutch was shifting its higher education funding model to making it contingent upon a number of key indicators, including student numbers. So financing these small subjects and protecting them effectively meant taking money away from increasing class sizes in the non-protected areas. So these subjects, which included new disciplines such as international relations, communications and media studies, but also the big traditional courses such as English and Dutch language, started to agitate their own crisis. And at this time, we see two interesting reports that try to resolve the tension between the Kleine Lettere and the other humanities subjects. Both of these reports, Windows on the World in 2002 and the report of the Cohen Commission, Sustainable Future for the Humanities, published in 2008, made the point that humanities need funding partly because they are valuable, but partly because they are useful. And specifically, the Cohen report asked for some more money for them. But in parallel with this, there was a bigger change to the Dutch science system, and research quality measurement was becoming important. There was a sense amongst politicians that universities had plateaued. They were good, but not improving. So quality measures for teaching and research were introduced. In research, the ministry asked three key players in the sector, that's to say the Rector's Conference, the Science Council, and the Royal Academy for Arts and Science, to come up with a good, supported way of measuring research quality. And that system evolved into what is now the standard evaluation protocol. Departments are evaluated on a rolling five-year basis in terms of the quality of their research. Those that are not good enough lose the funding. The detailed management of the process and the development of the protocol itself in response to political wishes was steered by the tripartite partners but through an intermediary body, one of the Royal Academy's research centres, the Rathenau Institute. And that, since 1994, had specialised in science and technology policy. So, against this we see the Cohen Commission emerge. And the Cohen Commission promise, produced a beautiful report published by the University of Amsterdam Press. It promised the sun for humanities and for the Netherlands after the recent storms that had braced humanities and a bright future for all concerned. And in practical terms, Cohen was a very high profile report that was very well received by the minister at the time, but ultimately 
came at a bad time because of the financial crisis and the, necess the necessary austerity measures. So Cohen asked for 70 million euros a year to support humanities, expecting 30 or 40 million euros. But with the crisis, was only able to get 10 or 15 million euros from the government. But at the same time, it made a clear statement that one of the principles of the humanities was that they were useful and that usefulness should be measured in the standard evaluation protocol. What little resistance there was came to nothing because ultimately the deans of the faculties of the humanities in the 10 universities that have humanities agreed a process for the additional funding to be spent. That process was to be overseen by Professor Fritz van Oostrom, a high-profile public intellectual, best-selling historical author, as well as a former president of the Academy. He had been part of the Cohen Commission, and his involvement as a public intellectual gave a strong signal that this public dimension and value was an important part of the discussion. And of course, in operationalizing and implementing this uh, the, in the standard evaluation protocol, this is what the discussions came down to, a very, set of, a very technical set of documents. So the Royal Academy established a commission which was formed under the Utrecht philosopher uh, Kemper Algra. He wrote a concept report which is shown in the first graphic on this page. The report, Developing Indicators for Research Quality in the Humanities in a way that would allow the, the, the quality of, that, of research to be measured. Central to that was devised a schematic for measuring research quality, shown in the second graphic. Central to this was peer review of all quality measures. But the next level of distinction was that quality consisted of two halves, social and scientific quality. And we can see in the excerpt in the third graphic that social quality, the bottom half of the diagram, was not substantively a smaller or less important part of the mix. So the agreement in the Netherlands, or at least the ground for agreement, came in a technical report. And the technical report said further work needs be, to be done. We need to have pilots in particular disciplines. And those pilots were undertaken and a consultation undertaken about those pilots. There's an interesting question about how the report was received by the community, by the ministry and the tripartite players. The tripartite players were universally highly supportive of the process. And at the level below the universities, the level of the de de departments and the research schools which represent the departments, again, they were happy with the practical results of the measuring research quality. One of the interesting things was that the, they found out that just as there are different patterns of publishing of sci in science journals, there's different patterns of publishing in the kind of non-science outlets, the technical and public outlets. So some disciplines publish widely in their own, uh, the, what they call the Wachbladder, which is to say the, the specialist professional press. Others publish far more in newspapers. And this ties the, the scientific and the social quality part of the debate together. So to say the issue of quality is not between social and societal, but the two issues are part of the same whole. The process appears to have been able to progress because it was independent, pragmatic, and flexible. But they are precisely the kind of qualities in a political process that can, leave you, that can lead you into trouble and lead that process to be later discarded. So the main point that I want to take away from this case study is that agreement was reached. Agreement was reached of a way to measure impact. And measuring the societal impact did not place the onus on the scholar to deliver that impact. Just make the research available in particular outputs, which others in society could then use and demonstrate the value of. So to return to my original question, what the purpose of the disagreement was in the case of the Netherlands, the disagreement formed a motivation to solve a wider problem, the problem of the sustainability of humanities finances. The disagreement motivated partners to work together towards a solution, and critically not simply to continue the argument. There was progress in the argument, but that progress did not, was not produced by the argument, but by the fact that on the one hand, the ministry lubricated 
the changes through regular tranches of finance. But on the other hand, the tripartite system also contributed to progress by making serious attempts and concessions to respond to the concerns of the ministers and politicians who ultimately wanted the process to allow them to say that Dutch research was good and getting better. The solution was banal. It wasn't high tech, it wasn't definitive. But it basically it came down to an agreement that scholars would ag agree to behave in a slightly different way as part of their expected scholastic behavior. That is to say, they would make their research findings available to a much wider public than hitherto and try to do so in ways that attracted external recognition that could be measured and hence the quality of that impact evaluated. So as a final conclusion, what I'm not saying is that the Dutch system is perfect or in any sense best practice. I've deliberately omitted the difficulties, barriers and problems that have occurred in the last decade as this has unfolded. But interestingly, the Netherlands has reached a successful consensus or stands at the brink of doing that. So looking into the future, I think what we're going to do with our further analysis in the coming months is to explore how that consensus has dealt more substantially with the tensions that we outlined at the outset. And those tensions are, that are at the heart of arts and humanities research across the board between academic excellence and social value. Thank you very much.